thought I'd pull out what I thought were the core themes that matter whatever level you're talking about. So whether you're talking about the what can we do on the global level to what can we do on the business level to what can I do at home, there's six themes that matter. And the six themes are this. The first is knowledge matters. It's absolutely vital that we demystify this realm if we ever want to get anything effective done in securing it. We have to move past the situation where um, we view it for the it crowd, or as one White House official put it to me, um, he described cybersecurity as a, quote, domain for the nerds. The internet used to be a domain only for the nerds. Now we all depend on it. The security of it is equally not just for the nerds. We have to move past the situation where the president received a briefing on cyber uh, issues and then um, reportedly asked for it repeated back, quote, this time in English. That's not a knock on Obama. That would happen at pretty much every single major corporation, university, think tank, you name it. This leads to the second key theme, people matter. Cybersecurity is one of those wicked problem areas because it has all sorts of complexities and trade-offs, but it's wicked not because of the technical side. It's because of the people part. Now, the people part makes it useful as a writer because you can spice up a story. You know, um, you can, uh, everything from the foundational role that porn played in the history of the internet to um, the time that Pakistan accidentally kidnapped all the world's cute cat videos for a day. It actually did happen. Um, you can use stories like this, but the bigger point is that if you want to set up a response, again, at the global level to business, agency, whatever level, you have to understand that the people behind the machines are inherently part of every threat and every needed response. Now, to go into a little bit more depth, um, because you know, we're at an institution of learning, this also is how we need to reframe one of the most critical areas of this is, is cybersecurity just a technical issue or is it also a human capital and human opportunity issue? So think about it this way. In 2008, the Department of Homeland Security had just 40 people working full time on cybersecurity. Since then, that number has been multiplied by 50. And of course, DHS is not stopping saying, well, that's enough. It'll continue to grow. Take what happened at DHS and that repeated at pretty much every agency out there, whether it's the Department of Defense, to Health and Human Services, to you know what I mentioned, the New York State government, to also playing out at companies, and again, companies that are technology companies to companies that are car manufacturers, you name it. So when you see that play out, you quickly realize, hold it, we've got an issue here. We've got a people problem that's also a policy problem. Essentially, the, the cyber security job market is growing so fast, it's outstripping available labor pools. And it's not just a numbers game. They're not just a quant quantity issue. There's also a quality issue. One survey of hiring managers found that um, they were only 40% of them were satisfied with the quality of the people that they were recruiting and hiring in this space. So, and again, go back to the broader point of the, of the, of the book. Don't just think about this as the people that work who either come out of the computer science department or work in the IT department because whatever department in the business or the government agency you work in, you will be leading, managing, making decisions on cybersecurity. To use Target as an illustration, I can guarantee you the public affairs people at Target wish they had a playback here in terms of un better understanding cyber than it's not just what happened in their own networks, but how they talked about it after the fact. So the point is you've got this gap. Now, it's a classic bad news, good news story, though. It's incredibly, um, what, how do we deal with labor gaps? We throw money at the problem. So it is a great time to be someone with the skills 
or someone coming out of a school with the skills because the salaries are good and growing. In fact, um, one study found that uh, cybersecurity folks are making 37% more on average than other people coming out of IT. So set aside whether you're going to go become you know, a, a, a writer, a poet, a plumber, just within the IT field, you're more likely to make more in this space. But that good news story, it means it's also good news for institutes and programs interested and have the capacity to train. It's, of course, a bad news story for the companies and agencies that are trying to hire people because they're bidding against themselves. This is even more so for government because that's the problem of how, how do we often train someone up and then we see them taken away and bidded back at us, particularly within the military side. It's also, um, you can think about this as a, a human capital opportunity at the regional level. So if this is a $120 billion industry, where are the people who work in it and the businesses they work in it going to be located? And you're seeing a, a, a attempt in, in the state and local level, everyone looking at, hold it, we could be a hub for this. We want ours to be the cybersecurity version of Silicon Valley or Detroit with automobiles, et cetera. So there's a competition here. That competition and how I just discussed it leads to the third theme incentives. Throwing money at a problem is basically trying to incentivize a solution. And what I'm getting at here is if you, beyond just the money, if you want to understand why something is or isn't happening in cybersecurity, don't just look at the network design. Look at the incentives in play. Look at the payoffs, the motivations, the relative costs, the organizational culture, the reward structures. There is a reason why finance companies are so much better at their own cybersecurity and that critical human value we teach our kids of sharing, which is so important in cybersecurity. Finance companies, are, there's a reason why they're so much better than power companies are. But again, don't just focus on the, the sexy scenarios we always hear about. The power might go out. Actually, the healthcare industry has the greatest number of um, reported intrusions. As one cybersecurity expert put it, quote, um, if our financial industry regarded cybersecurity the way the healthcare sector does, I would stuff all my cash in a mattress. This role of incentives also points to what government can and should be doing in this space. In some situations, as a trusted information provider, and in other situations, changing market incentives, which is what we also call standards and regulation, which we've seen play out in so many other fields, but we're behind the curve in this field. Fourth, history matters. There's a history to how we got here with the internet, and it's important to understand that, but it's also important to learn from history outside the internet. So for example, if you're worried about a realm of commerce and communication, and you're particularly worried about this mix of criminal actors, state actors, and then this fuzzy thing in the middle of state-linked, maybe criminal actors, well, learn from the age of sale and how they dealt with pirates and privateers, which there's a lot of parallel privateers to what we're dealing with cyber militias and the like. Or if you want to understand what government should be doing then why not look at the most successful government agencies in history and say, how do I learn from them? Um, in particular, the story of this uh, that we explore in the book is the Centers for Diseases Control, the CDC. If you don't know the story, it's a great one. The CDC starts with a couple scientists taking a $10 collection. And this organization goes on to stop malaria inside the United States, smallpox on a global level, it also serves as a crucial back channel to the Soviets during the Cold War. All these great things. So let's learn from that. This leads to the um, fifth uh, and um, the, 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 the last point that I'll make here. Ben Franklin had a saying, quote, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The CDC did studies and found 200 years after Ben Franklin said that, he really was right. That if you wanted to succeed in public health, prevention is so much more important than just the cure. Ben Franklin was also right in cybersecurity. While we want to overcomplexify this, 
the reality is that very basic steps of cyber hygiene would go an incredibly long way. One study found that they would stop um, up to 94% of all cyber attacks. Now, when people hear that, sometimes they go, mm -mm -mm, I'm, I'm really special. Well, one, statistically, we can't all be in the 6%. Two, if you speak to your IT department, they would say, if I didn't have to spend so much time on the low level stuff, I could focus in on the high end stuff. And three, if you study pretty much every major successful advanced threat campaign, they typically get in through low level means that basic cyber hygiene would stop. Uh, heck, the most important um, example of this is actually the most important foreign government penetration of US military networks. And it happened when a foreign spy agency did a candy drop, which is a lot like what it sounds. They drop not candy, but a shiny object in the dirt of a parking lot outside a US military base. A soldier walking by saw that shiny object, was curious, picked it up, it was a memory stick, and then he grew more curious. Well, I wonder what's on this thing. And so he physically walked it inside the military base and plugged it into his classified computer. That was the most successful foreign government penetration of US military networks. As I joke, um, that's not just uh, cyber hygiene, that's basic hygiene, that's the five second rule. Um, <laughs> but the point here is this prevention and thinking about it as a hygiene matter also allows us to come at it in a, in a broader way. I teach my kids, cover your mouth when you cough, not because it protects them. Think about it for a minute. There's no value to protecting yourself when you cover your mouth when you cough. But it's because we'll never get at this issue unless we all have this collective ethic of bearing responsibility for everyone that you connect with across the day, whether you're talking about coughing or your cyber hygiene. And so to bring the story full circle, um, at the beginning of the talk, I explained how I, you know, I was seven years old when I first saw a computer. Um, it was actually a Commodore. Now, the idea that this machine would one day steal people's money, steal people's identity, be a weapon of mass disruption, I would have begged my dad not to turn on that dangerous device. But today, we completely accept that because of all the incredible, what back then were superpowers it's given us. Back then, the idea that you could instantly know the answer to any question, that was you know Professor X from the X-Men. Now it's Google. And so the point here is that the same as it was back then, I hope is how it will be in the future. We have to accept and manage the risks of this world because of all the wonderful things that we can achieve in it. And that, to see a line from the title of the book, is what everyone needs to know. Thanks.